morning, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Kenny, for the introduction. When I got the introduction, I said I must make this time. Then when you said I had 20 minutes, I thought, um, help me Jesus, because um, <laughs> in my uh, church tradition, you know, my pastor uses the first 20 minutes to clear his throat. <laughs> it's quite an exercise to work um, as a Black Pentecostal with a 20-minute block. So I've actually written things down, which is contrary to my church's uh, orality, where our tradition is to speak things out, but to try and stick to the 20 minutes, I've actually had to write it down. Um, so um, I work with visual and audio text, so much of this presentation is going to be video and audio material, which I used to research with. Um, and um, the only other thing that I think I need, that's it, that's all good. So you can start the clock now, because I think I can manage the 20, 20 minutes. Okay, right, so we're just going to hopefully make sure the technology works. I'm just going to kick off with um, a film clip from a film that I made for Channel 4 called Ghetto Britain. It's not on the regular website because we had a few legal issues with it, so it's on More 4. It's the only place we can give it. <laughs> Is a black Pentecostal theologian doing taking on the racist BMP in Dagenham? And I'll answer the question at the end. The title of this presentation describes a discreet theological practice, namely doing black Pentecostal theology as social action through the media arts of film, music, and drama. The motivation for this work is twofold. The first is a theological aspiration to rethink theological methodology as consequence of an ongoing conversation with media texts. The second motivation is political collaboration. In partnership with black church groups and social movements, I engage in social action across a range of issues confronting post diaspora Caribbean communities. Both of these motivations are resistances, but with a difference. Within the open cosmology of black Pentecostalism, resistance is a pneumatological category a spiritual warfare against the forces of non-being. This viewpoint, however, is not without social consideration. For instance, in post-colonial biblical interpretation of the New Testament, every exorcism of Jesus is in one way or another anti-colonial, a symbol of the casting out of the Roman legions of the body of Israel. I'll put a bit of theology in there because I'm a theologian. In this brief talk, I will first sketch the specific theological method that informs artistic practice and afterwards control three projects or exorcisms related to the theological categories of incarnational theology, restorative justice, and the preferential option for the poor. These categories are illustrated in and through the media arts of contemporary gospel music, independent and commercial television filmmaking, and BBC radio drama. So just a bit about the method um, as we uh, move on. Doing theology through media arts is neither benign or ephemeral. All Christian artists endeavor to signify on a particular hermeneutic. Therefore, the critical question for theologians in cultural practice is what reading strategy informs their work? Now, as a black Pentecostal theologian, my approach is governed by a critical correlation of an emancipated reading of the Christ of faith, which is Christ for us today, and culture as a source of theological reflection, specifically late modern Jamaican music. This entanglement, the entanglement of these two discourses, I name as Jesus Dove. Jesus Dove is a mediation of the Christ of faith by an episteme of reggae dub production. Reggae dub, as a recording technique, is a deconstruction and reconstruction of sound and words enacted by an interested producer. Correlated with Christology, dub repositions and reworks and reinterprets the Christ of faith to address questions of black freedom, black flourishing. This emancipatory Christology is sanctified, I'm getting churchy now, you see. It is sanctified or put to work as a spiritual practice embedded in a variety of themes across a range of media arts. And in the time that remains, I will provide three examples of this practice. The first is related to incarnational theology. The first example contests the meaning of the incarnation in Western thought. To answer the question, how do we think of the incarnation in light of the persistence of premature black death? I reconfigure incarnational theology as a social category. The artistic response to this challenge is found in the gospel music track, 
incarnation, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs, from my contemporary gospel album, the Jamaican Bible Remix. The lyrics of this song fold incarnational theology into Windrush church folks' experience of post-war Britain. We went to um, senior citizens' homes in Birmingham to get first-hand accounts of people who were here in the 1950s about their experiences and wove that into a lyrical um, analysis. And, and obviously the, the chorus line to this is about no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. And I'm going to play two and a half minutes of it in a minute. Uh, um, the visuals, however, concern the hypervisibility of racial terror in the form of black death in custody. What we wanted to do was then rethink the incarnation in the present crisis around state violence against black and brown bodies. So I'm just going to play you a few minutes of the, the track. We have to sample uh, audio from the Jamaican New Testament because one of the funders was the Bible Society. So every now and then you hear, you hear this Jamaican voice pop out, it's because um, that's uh, part of the, the funding agreement. <laughs> In 1955, it is believed another 15,000 will make the long journey. Already their coming has caused a national controversy, but one point must always be borne in mind. Whatever our feelings, we cannot deny the fact. For all our British citizens, and as such, are entitled to the identical rights of any member of the empire. Chapter 1. No, do one where the wood. John Mars. John 1 14 tells the story of Jesus' incarnation, that the Word becomes flesh and lives amongst us. It means that God, who is fully God and fully man, takes on human form. The incarnation means that unequivocally, all creation is good and that all flesh, no matter what colour, no matter what tone, is good. My parents believed in this meaning of the incarnation, that their flesh was good. They were immigrants from Jamaica who came to work in Britain after the Second World War. But they soon came to realise that not everybody thought the same. When they went to open places to live, they were greeted with signs that said, No blacks, no Irish, and no dogs. One outcome of the album project was dialogue with one of Britain's most famous, Britain's most famous gospel choir, the Kingdom Choir, and the collaboration with the choir's leader, Karen Gibson, because what's important in terms of doing this kind of work is that you have social impact. And we were doing social impact if it was a category within uh, being measured within universities. Karen Gibson, the product of the dialogue with the choir, as if you know anything about black Pentecostal choirs, it's incredibly difficult to do anything political, but I used the album as a way of inspiring them to think about their craft in a different way. And one product was the choir performing Marvin Gaye's Critique of Ecological Degradation, Mercy, Mercy, Media Ecology, at COP26 in Glasgow. And I've just got a 16 second snippet of that of them doing. Oh, 
The second category, a second example is restorative justice, specifically the Hebrew Bible tradition of repair for damage done. Jesus' dove encompasses racial reconciliation and the thorny question of reparation for the trafficking, forced labor, and genocide of millions of Africans in the so-called transatlantic slave trade. Two visual projects translate restorative justice into documentary film. The first is the 2005 Channel 4 documentary, Empire Pays Back, and the second is the soon to be released after Noah, Christian Slavery and Reconciliation. Empire Pays Back makes its point of departure financial compensation for slavery's recompense. I'm just going to play you a clip where we begin the process of working out how much Britain would have to pay to the English-speaking Caribbean reparation. It only takes two seconds to read this line. The second film, which is after Noah, it's been released on the 25th of this month. Um, the focus here, though, is on the, is on the category of repairing the, the uh, it, it, get my point here. In contrast, after Noah considers reparation at the ideological level or the repairing of the theological categories, of the, category of theological anthropology by drawing attention to the Christian construction of whiteness in the enterprise of violence at the colonialism. So whereas the first film is about financial compensation, the second film is about the ideas that underpin slavery, racial terror, excuse me, Christian points of view. So in, I'm just going to pay you a slip that this is Willie Jennings from Yale talking about the way in which Christianity in the Caribbean help to construct the categories of white and black and therefore legitimate to be um, enterprise. Here we go. And that film is going to be released um, in a few weeks, so um, it'll be available to, um, uh, to watch. But what I want to say is, again, both projects have real-life outcomes. The first film, Empire Pays Back, was screened in Jamaica. Still waiting for the royalties check, uh, if you know, <laughs> the Jamaican Broadcasting Association. Uh, um, a couple of academics from the university tell me that they watched the film. It, it got them fired up about thinking about reparations in the Jamaican context, which has always been a, a backseat issue for them in particular. But it led to what has eventually become the CARICOM Commission, which I'm an honorary member of. And if you know anything about CARICOM recently, they've won £20 million in compensation with the University of Glasgow and are now looking at doing other things with other universities. Also, the second film is part of an ongoing project I have with the Anglican Church to get reparation for the Anglican Church for its work at the Codrington Plantation for 140 years. Anglican Church run a slave plantation in Barbados. Uh, claims that they gave compensation back in the 1830s, but they gave it to build roads, not to the descendants of the enslaved people. So it's an ongoing project, having a radio program, two parts are out in a couple of months about as well. So both of these, again, connected to social movements, to have real life consequences, seeing the delivery of reparations. Les and I were on a committee, we can't say anything about it because we both signed gagging orders. Les will probably tell you because he won't care. <laughs> <laughs> but I do care about the ensuing. Especially by a major corporation, we've been involved in the project for the last year, trying to get um, compensation out of a major corporation. And the tragedy is they were about to write the cheque, but there were then internal tensions within the organisation because they didn't want to go be the first major institution of that time to go first. And that's what we can say about it, but we may be revisiting it. The third category, an example of the preferential option for the poor. Third example, uh, this is a trope from classic Latin, Latin American liberation theology justified in scripture which prioritizes the material poor in salvation history. Recontextualized and reoriented as a thematic concern in media art, preferential option for the poor is the centerpiece of the radio drama series, Jesus Peace. It's an album by the game, as you know. Starring jazz sax saxophonist, Soweto Kinch, the four-part drama tells the story of an ex-gang member turned pastor. The pastor, because you know the detective story, Martin Glenn helped me with um, navigating detective story genre. Everything talks to the story, the, the detective has a thing. This guy uses the gifts of the spirit, to um, solve crime in the community, but the, but the glitch is he can't use these gifts if he's related to anybody or he's in love with them. So that's how he sets up the drama. And in this scene I'm going to just play for you, he confronts for the first time a son who he thinks is one of the suspects with this crime, but he's a son from an outside relationship. And so I'm just going to play a few seconds of him confronting this, uh, 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 this child. Again, it's online, you can listen to it at, at the earliest convenience, but it just gives a snippet of the kind of way in which we take the preferential option for the poor, but not focusing on issues of um, uh, structural impoverishment in the black community. But it doesn't end there. 
because preferential option for the poor is also a feature of my own university practice. But in this case, the concern is with the black poor, working class, working, black, uh, students of working class, working poor communities. And to explore this issue in terms of engaging them with education, I developed an idea for BBC Bristol called Ebony Towers with a, a young and upcoming producer then, David Olashoga. Uh, the documentary compared the relative success of African American intelligentsia compared to its British counterpart. Right, I'm going to um, end it there, obviously, see Paul Gilroy later on. Um, again, the outcome of this, this project is, is real world. Um, when I was, uh, I used the film to engage with community groups, social organisations about how we could bring more black people into the university. When I was working at Birmingham University, we set up an access course, free access course in the community for any black person wanting to study theology. One of the students who came on the access course was Anthony Reddy. Already had a first degree, but it was, an, it was in, his introduction to black liberation theology. He's just about to become the first ever black professor of theology at Oxford. Yeah. Started off as an activist. <laughs> and had at that time, it was 20, 20 black PhD students when I was working at Birmingham University. When I went to Canterbury Christchurch University, I was working with Gabby, we set up a project in Woolwich just to engage West African church pastors, you know, for big issues around West African church pastors, theological education. We put over 100 West African church pastors through a degree course in theology. Some of them have gone on to master's degrees. Two are about to start a PhD this year. Well, um, at my current role, well, one of the current gigs, I'm a Jamaican, you know, so I work through jobs, you know, <laughs> in other roles. Um, uh, um, so I'm, uh, uh, my current role, one of my current roles, the Queen's Ecumenical Foundation, we have 65 black postgraduate students. That's the largest cohort of black students studying anything in Britain and in Western Europe. Why again? Because this work has to have real life consequences. So, in summary, why is a black Pentecostal theologian taken on the BMP in Dagenham? Because good Pentecostal theology must confront evil, and black theology cannot be separated from resisting or exorcising injustice both inside and outside of the theological academy. Thank you. Thank you.